A young man in a light t-shirt and cargo shorts pads down the worn hiking trail. It's a trail he's walked hundreds of times before, and as far as he knows, he'll get the opportunity to walk it a few hundred more. It's a smooth, even path, cutting through a lush forest on the edge of town, with plenty of nice benches and a few trash cans for dog walkers along the way. It has all the comforts a casual hiker can ask for. It's safe, familiar. He doesn't know why, but the young man feels like perhaps today is the time for a change. Maybe it's the subconscious will to avoid monotony, or the fact he read an article a few weeks back about how varying your roots is the best way to avoid being kidnapped. Whatever the reason, he stops for a moment to pull up his socks, takes a swig from his water bottle, and ventures out into the heart of the woods. Who can blame him, really? We all need a change sometimes, and it's not like this poor young man has any idea what's in store for him out there. His boots crunch on the undergrowth, small things skittering out from amongst the dry leaves and twigs. He always encountered other people on his usual trail, which was fine, of course. He didn't mind a little socializing on his walks. But there's something oddly comforting about the true loneliness you can find in the woods. It's just nature and you, properly acquainted. No screens, no keyboards, no emails, texts, DMs, or obligations. It's natural, the way things should be. The young man closes his eyes for a moment and takes a deep breath in, just to enjoy it. That beautiful, clean spring air. A pleasure money can't buy. When he opens his eyes, he notices something in the distance, even deeper in the forest than before. It's large and brilliant white. Some kind of structure. How strange, he thinks. There are no paths leading to this thing, whatever it is. How could it have been built? And why? Was it another one of those weird obelisks that appeared in the desert a couple of years before that he saw on the news? It's the most interesting little mystery he's experienced in a while, and nothing about it seems to be throwing up any overt red flags. What would be the harm in going a little deeper to check it out? The question would certainly stay with him if he never found out. As he approaches, he notices that it's a large cube made from some strange, glossy plastic. There are no gaps or rivets, no real signs of how the cube was constructed at all. The only thing differentiating any of the sides is a metal door on one of the faces. He circles the cube a couple of times just to see if he's missing anything. Nothing really appears out of the ordinary, other than the very existence of the cube itself. He looks over his shoulder before approaching the door. No cameras, nobody waiting in the bushes to jump him. Not yet, at least. He steps forward, takes an uneasy breath, and opens the front door. It's a slow, cautious motion. After all, he has no idea what could be waiting for him inside. For all he knew, the whole cube would be primed to explode, with the opening of the front door being the activation mechanism. But no, what surprises him most is how oddly mundane the inside is. He takes out his phone, turns on the flashlight, and shines it inside. It's just an empty room. Pretty much exactly what you'd expect the least imaginative person in the world to suggest is inside a big plastic cube in the woods. Huh? Two strange little things catch his eye, though. Two doors on the adjoining back walls of the cube, a door to each wall. Huh? That can't be right. Doubting his own memory, the young man steps out and circumnavigates the cube again. There are no apertures in the back walls of the cube, so the doors inside would just lead to nowhere. Perhaps it's some kind of unfinished construction project, he muses. He'd read all about modular living and tiny homes. Maybe the plan was simply to cut in those two extra doors at a later date and fit in a skylight. People live in retrofitted shipping containers these days. Stranger things have definitely happened. Still, there it is again, that same nagging curiosity that brought him here in the first place. Even though he knows, logically, the two doors inside the cube lead to nowhere, he knows that if he leaves without trying them himself, it'd stick with him. He's just that kind of guy. The unanswered question weighs on him like a ship's anchor tied around his neck. It's always better to just… know. He ventures inside the cube again, lit once more by his phone's flashlight, and tries the door on the left. Even though he knows it should be a dead end, he still does it with that same trepidation as before, like there could be something waiting behind it, something with big eyes and even bigger teeth. He'll feel so silly for even worrying about this when he sees the wall on the other side. But that isn't what he sees. In fact, to his immense surprise, the door opens up into the interior of what seems like an identical cube. He's so shocked by the impossibility of it that he steps back, the door swinging back into place. No, 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 he thinks. That's impossible. He shakes his head and rubs his eyes. It had to be some trick or illusion. There's no possible way that this door can lead anywhere. 
He steps forward and, with great care, opens the door again. Nothing has changed. There's still an identical room to the one he's standing in, just waiting for him on the other side of the door. Maybe it's a projection or a mirror? Some kind of advanced AR tech being experimented on in the woods? The young man reaches forward. His hand slips across the threshold into the new room. It's real. It's an actual space beyond the doorway. There's even another two doors on the far wall. What on earth is going on? Wanting to be sure he isn't just going crazy, he leaves the cube one more time and checks the back walls. He runs his hand across them, smooth plastic, no seams, no tricks, nothing hidden. There is no explanation for what's going on in there. He's discovered something truly remarkable, an exception Mm. to the laws of physics as we know them, an anomaly in space. The sensible thing to do would have been to leave that second, find somewhere with cell service, and call other people to come check it out. If that had been the case, then things would have ended very differently for this young man. Instead, he decides to play pioneer. If there are other doors beyond the one into the impossible room, where do they lead? Are there even more incredible secrets just waiting for him to find them? He doesn't want to just be the person who dialed in about the initial discovery, while other people took over and did the exciting parts. Chances are, if he calls in about this, some shady government group will come and take the issue off his hands. He'll never know the true secret. It'll nag at him for the rest of his life. And he can't have that, can he? Guided again by the light of his phone, he enters the cube. After checking that the door on the right leads to exactly the same new room, he opens the left door once more and proceeds through, letting it close behind him. He looks around the room. It's absolutely identical, down to the smallest detail, not a crack or smudge out of place. He approaches the doors and looks beyond them, exactly as he's predicted, and on some level, hoped. There are more identical rooms on the other side. There's breaking the laws of physics, and then there's dropping a nuclear bomb on them. It all begins to go to his head. As he passes through each door, the only thing that seems to alter is the placement of the doors on the walls. It seems a little disorienting at first, like the room is being spun around from below, but he soon gets used to it. It's strange. Going into a series of identical rooms doesn't scream exciting in the abstract. But when you know those rooms are impossible, it adds a certain layer of intrigue to the proceedings. Eventually, he comes upon something strange. After so long essentially seeing the same room repeated at him, he's primed to notice even the smallest difference. As he scans the floor with the light of his phone, he notices a boot print on the ground. It looks a couple sizes bigger than his own, with a completely different tread pattern. The thought dawns on him with a difficult mix of emotions. He isn't the only one who's been in here. And maybe he's not even alone in here. He's never been the suspicious type. He likes to see the good in everyone and assume a basic level of human decency. But something about the knowledge that another person could be in here filled him with torrents of icy dread. It's a dread so great that it even overrides his curiosity. He knows on some animal level that he needs to leave right now or something terrible is going to happen to him. He turns, and it suddenly dawns on him. He doesn't remember which of the three doors in the room he entered through. In fact, he sped through so many rooms to get here, he can't remember which door he came through in any of them. The cold, thrumming pulse of dread soon heats up into panic. He tries to regulate his breathing. He needs to approach the situation logically. But how do you apply logic to a situation that's completely beyond it? He picks a door after an intense session of eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and commits, heading through it into an identical room, and then another, and then another, and then another. He checks his phone, his only light source, and feels another spike of panic when he realizes just how low the batteries are. Who would have known how quickly the flashlight eats up charge? But without it, it's total darkness. He'll have no way out. He needs to get out before his battery runs out, or he'll never get out at all. Faster and faster, he passes through doors at random on the confidence that anyone who walks long enough will end up somewhere. He's looking for changes, landmarks, any signs of salvation. He finds, to his immense relief, that some doors have little red dots marked next to them on the wall in permanent marker. Whoever was here before might save him now. This relief has some cold water thrown on it by another scrawling a few rooms down. Someone had messily written, this is hell, on the wall in red, except this time, It wasn't a pen that left the markings. At the bottom of the wall, he can see a few bloody fingernail chunks sitting in a dry brown puddle. Had they gotten out, whoever they are? Or is their skeleton festering in one of these rooms? At this point, the young man is mortally terrified. 
Never before has death seemed like such a tangible presence, and not a quick death, but starvation and dehydration, two of the most terrible ways to go of all. He can feel hot tears running down his cheeks. He picks himself up, trying to choke out the sobs before they can rack his body. He needs to keep moving. Next room, next room, next room, next room, next room. With each one, hope shrinks and despair grows. There's no light, no progress, just the same thing over and over again. It's so relentless that, at some point, he needs to stop and catch his breath. He's breathing raggedly, his lungs burn, he's beginning nowhere at impressive speeds. It's only when he manages to slow his heart rate and quiet his breathing that he notices he's not the only one in the room. Their breathing is even more strained and wheezy than his. He turns slowly, almost paralyzed by fear, and turns the waning light of his phone into the corner of the room. There's a figure standing in the corner of the room. It's a person, but not the kind of person you ever want to run into. They're filthy and gaunt, with deep-set, wild eyes. Their mangled fingertips, nails broken off, are crusted over and red. Their teeth, which appear long thanks to recessed gums, chatter against each other. I didn't ever think you'd find me, they say, voice a rattling whimper. Have you come to help me out? The young man doesn't know what to say. He's wrapped in a mix of pity and terror for the pitiful human being before him. How long had they been in here, just sitting in the dark, alone? The thought sickens him. I'm sorry, the young man says without thinking. I'm lost too. The stranger heaves a dry sob. No, I'm sorry, the stranger says. I'm just so hungry. Before the young man can say another word, the stranger is on him. They've got the strength of desperate insanity. Their bony, blood-stained hands clasp around the man's neck. The attack is so sudden, so shocking, so brutal. He screams and drops his phone. It tumbles to the ground and shatters. The horrors that happen next all transpire in the dark. The young man screams, but nobody with any interest in helping can hear him. Being trapped will do strange things to a person, but you don't need to tell anyone trapped in SCP-167 that. Also known as the Infinite Labyrinth, this anomaly is an absolute nightmare for anyone suffering from claustrophobia, the fear of enclosed spaces. Which is not to say it shouldn't also be terrifying to pretty much everybody else. The anomaly doesn't look like much to the casual observer, perhaps a work of avant-garde art or a particularly unwelcoming public bathroom. It's a cube measuring 10 meters around its edges, made from a shiny white plastic polymer with a large metal door affixed to the front. At face value, it seems to exhibit no anomalous spatial qualities, with the inner chamber having consistent internal dimensions with the outside. Two of the three remaining walls in the chamber display a pair of identical metal doors. Despite logically leading back outside of the cube, both of these doors instead open up to identical rooms, each of which also have two doors. This goes on, to the best of our knowledge, in perpetuity. Studies indicate that this anomaly has been explored extensively by people in the past, due to a high number of markings and unusual items from a number of time periods being left inside. Religious idols circa 500 BCE, several treasure chests circa 1500 CE, and even several SCPs, the specifics of which I am sadly not at liberty to share here. The complexity of the labyrinth isn't the only thing creating a risk of being lost within. All signs point to the anomaly having non-Euclidean geometry. Multiple researchers sent into SCP-167, each attached to the opening with a lifeline to prevent them getting lost, found that their experience getting to the same point involved passing through a number of vastly different rooms. It is currently unknown what causes these spatial distortions. Foundation researchers are extremely curious about potential connections to SCP-184, an object also known as the Architect which causes notable spatial distortions inside any building wherein it is placed. Cross-tests between the two anomalies are currently pending approval from the O5 Council. Because the anomaly appears largely benign, one researcher even pitched using 167 as temporary storage space for low-risk anomalies. However, just because an anomaly is typically benign doesn't mean terrible accidents can't happen when the proper safety precautions aren't followed. The following note on the file from lead researcher Dr. Klein illustrates one notable incident of a tragedy as a result of lax safety procedures. As most of you are aware, an SCP Foundation senior researcher was videotaped entering SCP-167 several days ago without the requisite ball of twine, and he has not yet returned. His ultimate fate is unknown, but the search teams have turned up nothing. 
Let this be a reminder to all of you just how easy it could be to get lost in there if you don't utilize some method of marking your path. If I find that any other researcher has disobeyed the safety regulations and entered without a ball of twine, no matter how far deep they intend to go, they will find themselves being transferred to another facility for researching Keter-class SCPs, where they should have ample motivation to learn to follow safety regulations quite quickly. Signed, Dr. Klein. Because of its lack of sentience and static nature, SCP-167 has been given the safe object class. It has been removed from the forest and is kept in a padlocked room within Research Command 06, and anyone who seeks to conduct explorations into the interior of the anomaly must obtain permission from a relevant member of personnel with clearance level 3 or above. And remember, no matter where you're going, whether that be into the local forest or an anomalous cube, you're heading for disaster if you haven't planned how you're getting back. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-1051, Nevadan Extraterrestrial, for another anomalous location that you'd do anything to avoid getting trapped in. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.